Welcome to the Afghanistan Project Podcast. I'm Beth Bailey, and today I'm excited to welcome Kevin Reardon, whose distinguished legal career in both the civilian world as an, and as an Army JAG officer took him to Afghanistan in 2007. More than a decade after his military retirement, Kevin was called to serve in a different way when his former translator and friend, whom we'll be calling Abdul Hadi to protect his identity, uh, begged Kevin to help him escape Kabul during the U.S. withdrawal. Kevin Reardon is a graduate of Washington Lee University School of Law, and for 21 years, Kevin served in a reserve component of the Army JAG Corps. In 2007, he volunteered for active duty and deployed to Kandahar province later that year in October and stayed there until October of 2008. In Kandahar, Kevin served as the command judge advocate and mentored lawyers and judges within the Afghan National Army's 205th Corps. Kevin retired in 2010 as a lieutenant colonel, and in his civilian career, he spent 32 years working as an assistant district attorney before working for five years as an assistant public defender. Kevin, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you, Beth. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Ah, anytime. Um, I'd love to start by taking our listeners back to 2007. Can you tell us what motivated you to transition to active duty service? Well, as, as it did for most Americans, 9-11 made a huge impression upon me. Um, I wanted to find a way to serve, um, a, a way that I could contribute to the effort to uphold the rule of law, for one thing, against people who seem to recognize no laws, who were just willing to commit outrageous atrocities with reckless abandon. I uh, initially started looking at the uh, Judicial Commission to Guantanamo Bay. I was offered a job there, but I was kind of I mean, I, as you know, I'm a career. Pro I was a career prosecutor, and due process is something that's very important to me. Uh, I would not want to involve myself into something that would be lacking in what I believe any uh, fair and just judicial system should have. So uh, I was concerned that there were d due process protections uh, that were missing, at least at that time, in the judicial commission. Uh, rules. So I turned that down. Nevertheless, years went by. Um, I got to about early 2007. I had not been called upon yet. And I began to think, well, if there's something I can do, I need to go. I did not want to be one of these people going to uh, drill weekends and annual training and wearing the uniform and getting paid for it without putting myself in harm's way. I just didn't think that was fair to the people who were serving in Afghanistan and Iraq at the time. So I volunteered. Uh, I was offered a position as a command judge advocate uh, with a uh, training command in Kandahar province the Afghan Regional Security Integrated Command hyphen South. Uh, the training mission was to train the Afghan Army and the Afghan police. Um, my role was to serve as the commander's, the U.S. commander's legal advisor and also a mentor to my counterparts in the Afghan Army, the uh, judges, prosecutors, defense attorneys in the Afghan Army. So I thought, well, you know, I can make, maybe I can make a difference here, uh, given my experience in the civilian legal world and the military. So I said, yes, I'll do it. And I went. I was on active duty from about, uh, well, I went on active duty in October of 2007. Came off active duty in October of 2008. I spent a week in uh, deployment training. Um, bear in mind, I'd never been deployed before overseas. I had served stateside during the Persian Gulf War. So this was all new to me. I got on a plane with a lot of other soldiers. We flew overseas. 
uh, made some stops. Eventually, I landed. I climbed out of the back of a C-17 Air Force plane at Bagram Airfield. It was dark. It was at nighttime. Most of the soldiers were in groups. I was by myself. And I thought, you're 49 years old. You've just stepped out of the back of the plane. It's pitch dark. Nobody is here to meet you. And I thought, what the hell have you done? Well, <laughs> at that point, it was too late. Uh, so I saw some lights up ahead. I started walking. It was the um, USO guest house at Bagram. I went in there. I had made contact with a member of the trial to Army Trial Defense Service there. I called him, he came down, he got me a room, and that's how all this began. Wow, that is a very well-told story of, I can just see it right now, that that must have been a big change. When you prepared for this, did you know how much legal assistance the Afghan National Army was going to require, or was that something that you came to learn when you got on the ground, like how important the judiciary was going to be? Uh, I, I, uh, I received very little instruction from the Army specific to the job. I read as many books as I could. could, could. Um, in the weeks leading up to the deployment on um, Afghanistan, um, the world of Islam, uh, history, culture, politics, um, but very little formal instruction. I just had to figure things out once I got there. Wow. And what was it like every day as you're adjusting to life at RSIC in Kandahar? Uh, shocking. Um, I spent, I usually spent the mornings with R6 South at Kandahar Airfield, and then I drove over to the Afghan camp, uh, the camp of the 205th Corps. Um, there was an inner perimeter around Kandahar Airfield, and then there was an outer perimeter. And the uh, Afghan 205th Corps camp was between the inner perimeter and the outer perimeter. So I could drive over there to spend the rest of the time with them. Um, I was a little concerned about how I would get along with the Afghans. Before that trip, I had probably, uh, uh, probably met I could count on the fingers of one hand the number of times I've been with Muslim people. Uh, however, we got on very well. Um, I quickly discovered they were men, just like me, um, with uh, the same goals, the same um, plans and hopes and dreams. Uh, one of them was extremely funny. He could have been a stand-up comedian. Uh, I enjoyed his company immensely. Um, I found a way, you know, I decided that I just wanted to find out about them as people. For example, and I figured maybe I could have some influence if, if we developed good relationships. Um, I remember one day I talked with my uh, command judge advocate counterpart on the Afghan side uh, about snow. Uh, he had grown up in Kabul and as you may know it snows heavily there in the winter time. And I asked him, did you ever make a snowman? And he laughed and he said yes. And we had snowball fights. So we exchanged stories of uh, snowball fights. Also, um, we had been warned before going over about talking about religion. Uh, that was taboo. I happened to be Christian. They're Muslim. However, they wanted to talk about it. Um, 
they uh, one day my interpreter Abdul Hadi and I were riding back to the Turk camp and he said to me some of the other interpreters think Christians worship three gods but I say they only worship one god what do you say and I nearly drove off the road because I realized he was talking about the Trinity I, I thought how am I going to explain this uh, so I said, well, uh, let me talk to my priest at home and see what he says, and then I'll talk to you, okay? So I contacted my priest at home. I got an explanation that I didn't entirely understand. But anyway, I shared it with Abdul Hadi, and he said, and he, he, he clearly understood that I didn't understand all that well. And he said, well, that's okay. I, there are things about my religion I don't understand either. But they were very, they were very interested in us. Um, I know they were interested in Christmas decorations at, Ka at Kandahar Airfield. And one of, them, one of the lawyers one day said to me, who is this American soldier in the red suit? Red suit? Red suit? Oh, you mean Santa Claus. Yeah, and so I explained you know, the concept of Santa Claus. And they actually had me drive them to Kandahar Airfield to see the Christmas decorations. And we did. They loved it. Uh, they also wanted to eat American food in the DFAC, so we did that too. Um, and I, I, How I disappointed thinking, were they, or excited? Yes. Uh, was it good they, DFAC food? <laughs> uh, it was, it was, yeah, it was. They seemed to like it. Um, and then, of course, one day uh, we all had lunch together. I frequently ate in the uh, interpreter's camp with my interpreter. Um, you know, these are the things that I remember so well. Um, I remember, I'm very happy that I was able to establish positive and long-lasting relationships. I don't know how much I did to help them as far as the rule of law is concerned. Uh, sometimes I wonder, our systems are so different and our circumstances are so different. But, if nothing else, I was there and I believe they could tell that I cared, I was willing to listen and willing to help uh, whenever I could. I met with the, met with the lawyers daily uh, the prosecutor, defense attorney, the judges. I made suggestions. Um, I was also, my duties included visiting the Afghan jail, military jail. So I did that regularly um, to make sure the prisoners weren't, the detainees weren't mistreated. Also had to inspect the portable toilet. That was part of my job. Toilet <laughs> there were times All when right. I, had to, I had to complain about the portable toilet because it was outrageous. Um, <laughs> there were a lot of challenges for my counterparts. Many of the commanders had been what I would call warlords. They were veterans of the long struggle with the Soviets. They were mujahideen in their previous life. Well, actually, some of them had been in the Soviet-led Afghan army. Then they were Mujahideen, and then they were in an American-influenced and sponsored army. Um, they apparently had a lot of leeway as warlords, and they weren't always used to following the Afghan code of military justice. They had heard of it. They would tell you about their dedication and devotion to the Afghan Code of Military Justice, but they were used to doing what they wanted to do. So it was a challenge for the Afghan lawyers and for me as their mentor 
to get the commanders to act according to their own laws and regulations. We had some success, uh, but uh, it was it was challenging. I did a lot of traveling. Uh, Abu Hadi and I did a lot of traveling. We were on the roads a lot, going to various uh, installations, uh, training Afghan soldiers on the law of war, so non-judicial punishment. Of course, all that was very dangerous. Uh, every time I went out, I wondered if this was going to be the day when I'd get blown up. Thanks to God, I didn't. But it was, uh, had a way of concentrating his mind. Experienced a lot of rocket attacks. That got to be a regular thing at Kandahar Airfield. In fact, it got to be so predictable. There was there was a time when it seemed like every night around nine o'clock we'd get a rocket, and that went on for several days in a row. And then one night it got to be at about nine fifteen, and some other soldiers and I started looking at their watches and saying, "Isn't it time for a rocket attack?" And then. 9.30, we got the rocket attack. They were just a little bit late then. Fortunately, while I was there, no oh one goodness. was killed in a rocket attack. Um, they were Chinese-made rockets, kind of primitive. However, after I left, some people were killed in rocket attacks. Hmm. That sounds really like a very scary situation, but I'm I suppose you get used to it after a while. Like you said, the whole, yeah, oh, well, where I, is I, it? I, it's 9 o'clock. Like, where is our... Yeah, I just remember Thanksgiving of uh, 2007. I was in uh, Kalat. Um, I had a Thanksgiving meal at a uh, American, uh, small American base in Kalat. After the meal, we hit uh, golf balls off the roof. Then I went back to the main forward operating base at Kabul uh, Fab Apache. It was, and then that night we had mortar attacks. Uh, at least a couple of them, the Taliban were riding around on their motorcycles and firing mortars and so forth. Um, so there were there. We're always aware of danger. I did. It took me a long time after I got back to let go of that hypervigilance. Uh, eventually I did, at least to some extent. Was, those were dangerous. And imagine, you know, you got to leave that zone, but people like Abdul Hadi continued to live in it, you know, and that, like I have such a heart for Afghans who didn't get a break from that combat zone environment and have just lived under constant fear and attack for 20 years, basically. That's that's a oh, lot yes. of stress on your system. Oh, it is. Uh, um, I'm, sure it's, I'm sure it's done permanent yeah. physical and psychological damage. He gave our country 15 years of honorable service. And in return, our country abandoned him on the asphalt at uh, the airport of Kong. And that's, I'd love to, to go there. So you're, the big part of what we're going to talk about tonight is what you did for Abdul Hadi in that circumstance. But let's start a little bit further back because he had a special immigrant visa in process because of his work as an interpreter. Were you involved in that process of helping him with the SIV? So when did he start looking to get an SIV? I think it was... Shortly after I left Afghanistan in October of 2007. Actually, he might have begun before that. I, I remember writing him a letter of recommendation. Um, he, he was one of those people who keeps every scrap of paper he ever gets. And thanks be to God, he was one of those people who was 
that was how the final, uh, finally how the American government had no choice but to put stamp approved on his special immigrant visa because he had everything. But it was a long time. Um, you know, after I left Afghanistan, I stayed in touch. Uh, we exchanged email. Uh, social media came along. We started using social media. I knew he had a large family. I knew he was in school. I wanted to help him, so from time to time, I sent money to the family. Uh, over time, we became family. He sent me pictures of his family, including pictures of his wife. I did, from what I've read, that's very unusual in Islam, mm -hmm. in Afghan culture. I sent him pictures of my family. I'm married, I have two grown daughters. Um, it got to the point where uh, I became uncle and he became nephew. So we were family. And all those That's years, really amazing. He was waiting. He waited patiently. So patient. He is a person of great character, great strength. Um, you know, the problem with the SIV program is that Congress passed this program. And the fault uh, is neither, uh, the fault could be laid at administration after administration and Congress after Congress. They never allowed enough slots to satisfy the demand, and they never put enough people uh, at work to process these applications. So these people just languished for years waiting on a response. Uh, I think the, initial, the original legislation said that an SIV had to be processed within, I think, nine months. Nine months. Mm -hmm. Or like years, years. Right. Um, but then we got to 2021 and things went to hell. Uh, the Trump administration and signed an agreement with the Taliban and then the Biden administration chose to keep it. A very disappointing effort. set of circumstances that then puts people at risk. And, you know, I was oh, part of several yes. efforts early in that year, you know, with people like Abdul Hadi, where, you know, the, the, the officers and enlisted personnel who worked with them were saying, hey, this guy's been in the SIV queue for years and now he's really in danger. And I'm sure Abdul Hadi probably had threats against him. I think that's part of the SIV process. You have to document mm -hmm. the threat letters and things that you receive. I've seen some And of so the, these are uh, people who some of the letters he received threatening to kill him. It's, it's very scary. It, they are known, is. you know, they they it's a, so these are people who are already at such increased risk and now you've put them in this pressure cooker without having any kind of, you know, there was no plan, no way to There was no plan. get people I, out. I'm, right. I'm convinced Beth that but for the public pressure from veterans and other concerned citizens, there would have been no, no evacuation at all. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the evacuation that occurred was done grudgingly uh, and poorly planned, poorly executed. It was a debacle, just a debacle. Yep. Which not I, only risked lives like Abdul Hadi's, but also all of the service members that we sent in Exactly. To do this very, I mean, it just that the it, devastating it, it, effects exactly. of it are. Uh, I became more and more concerned as 2021 went along. Uh, I started mm -hmm. writing opinion pieces. Um, I contacted my congressman, uh, but nothing seemed to be happening. And cities after cities kept falling to the Taliban. Eventually, we got to one Saturday morning in, I think it was in early in August. Abdul Hadi called me. It was Saturday morning here. And he said, Uncle, Uncle, the Taliban are in the city. What should I do? I didn't know what to do. Uh, 
but I knew I had to do something. I could not leave him in this situation with his wife and his eight children after what he had done for me and for our country. He's my comrade in the war, and he is also my nephew now. So I had to help him. I had to figure something out. So 13 years after I left Afghanistan, the longest days of my deployment began that morning when he called me. Uh, I didn't know what to do. I, I started calling people. I called my former commander, uh, Thomas McGrath. He agreed to help. Um, I called uh, David Green, Colonel David Green, now Colonel David Green, of the Texas Army National Guard. I had met him when I was deployed. He agreed to help. Another fellow West Point grad, uh, but no longer with the Army, had heard about what I was doing. He agreed to help. It, we had never met, um, but yet he was motivated and helped immensely. My daughters helped. Uh, we started putting uh, Abdul Hadi's name and his family's names on every evacuation list we could find. Uh, I, my uh, colleagues and I used every contact we could um, think of. Eventually, we got to that final week. We urged uh, Abdul Hadi to take his family to the airport in Kabul. They did. They sat out there on the asphalt for days, along with thousands of other people. At that point, Abdul Hadi's SIV application had reached the point where he only needed a physical exam. He was to have the physical exam the week Kabul fell to the Taliban. He was that close. So, uh, one of us got a contact the State Department to write something we hoped the Americans inside the airport would honor and allow him and his family in. We actually made contact, Beth, with Americans who were inside the airport. We told them where Abdul Hadi and his family were, which gate, go there, they're at this gate, get them. They wouldn't go. Uh, they actually took a picture of Abdul Hadi and his family sitting on the asphalt outside the gate. I have a copy of that picture. They look exhausted. Did they but give so, an explanation? No, never, never, mm -hmm. no explanation. Sure. Now, how could you take a photograph of a family and not let them in? What kind of soulless person did that? I mean, it's, it's outrageous. Do you know uh, what gate it, was that that they? Oh, I don't, rem I don't remember, Beth. Um, but we tried so many ways to get them to act, the Americans inside the airport, and they just would not do it. You know, I, I grew up in a small town in Illinois, uh, the land of Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln practiced law in that area. I was very much a patriot. Uh, I, I love my country, um, very motivated to serve. But this experience changed the way I feel about my country forever. I, uh, that week, I took the flag down from front of my house. I folded it up and I put it in the storage room. And it's still there. And I don't, maybe I'll get it out someday, maybe I won't. But uh, not right now. It just changed everything. When yeah. we I put mine at half staff because I thought it was a moment of crisis and complete oh, it's, it's, sadness and devastation. I do want to say, I'm, I'd love to talk to some of the Marines. I've talked to Marines who and Army personnel who were at most of the gates, and I, I promise you they would have 
absolutely if they could let somebody in they would have i know that they had such strict guidance that was always changing from the state department personnel who would just kind of like come in and out to do their processing work but i know too i've talked to so many marines who talk about the moral harm that was done for them when they had to bring people in and then escort them back to the Taliban because the State Department said, nope, those papers are not good enough. You need to take them back. And just imagine, mm-hmm. you know, you've let this family in thinking that they're going to get to safety and then you have to take them back when you're watching the Taliban execute people at the airfield Tremendous because the Taliban injury. were providing security. Yeah. I, I just, uh, to me, I know they would have, yeah, and they would have loved to let those people in, you know, I know that it wasn't, it could not have been, you know, not the will on the part of U.S. military personnel, but they were under just I, such. I, I will say throughout, throughout this process, the State Department was the primary obstacle. They were the people throwing logs mm-hmm. in our path. Um, sure. Um, so, I mean, to think that Abdul Hadi was at the point where all he needed was a physical exam. And yes. I've talked to so many people in that exact circumstance who had everything, or the State Department had their their passports or their oh, visas, yes, whatever that the State Department everything. was keeping, and then they had to throw them on the pile, burn them, you know. And it's like, well, now you can't go because they have your documents and, and you're in this horrible situation it's terrible so i'd love to continue so you've got this picture of the family just exhausted hoping for anyone to come and pull them in and what happened next Uh, i think by thursday that final week uncle hadi told us we were communicating back and forth using uh no we use telegram signal and so on i learned all about encrypted text messages and so on and he said, the children can't go on anymore. We're going to go home. They went back to their apartment in Kabul. Um, the next day, the suicide bomber, or bombers, struck and uh, killed so many people, and American Armed Forces personnel. Oh, horrendous. Thanks be to God, Abdul Hadi had the good sense to take his family home. When I realized, when, it, when the last evacuation flight and went out and I realized they were not getting out, I wept. I just wept. I was so ashamed of what my country had done. I deeply out- outraged. And I, I don't cry easily. I just don't. Sometimes I wish I did. But I don't. But I did cry that day. I just was so ashamed and so fearful. Then we had to decide, the other members of the group and I, what to do next. We were afraid there was going to be a bloodbath in Kabul. We decided and advised Abdul Hadi to take his family to Mazar Sharif in the far north. Oh. But we had to get him money. And initially, all the uh, MoneyGram and uh, Western Union services were down. Now, it mm-hmm. so happened that we learned about something called Hawala. It's a mm-hmm. Islamic system of money transfer. We got, I think there was a Western Union somewhere in the area that was still open. We got the money to the Western Union. We had um, someone pick it up. And then through this Hawala process, we got the money to it. It worked. I've read articles about it several times. I still don't understand how it works, but it works. Um, we, We got money to so they got they had the money to we got them the money to buy bus tickets to Mazar Sharif. They went on this long cross country bus ride. Stopped several times at Taliban checkpoints, but Abdul Hadi is a very smart, articulate man and he talked his way through. 
got the family to Monster Sharif, continued to use the Hawala system to get the money while they were there. And then eventually when Western Union and Money Grandma reopened, we started using that approach. Uh, initially, they stayed in, uh, initially he was going to stay with his uncle. And I think the family did stay there one night, but the uncle did not want him there. I guess he was afraid about the consequences. So we got him the money to get into a hotel. They stayed some time in the hotel. We kept sending them money for food while we were looking for some way to get them out. So many, there were all kinds of uh, potential escape plans that were floating around. One of the early ones, looking back on it now, seems it seems ridiculous, was to put the put the people on inflatable boats and cross the river into T T T Tajikistan. Uh, I don't know who came up with that idea. It wasn't anyone in our group, but you know, that's what we were hearing, and uh, uh, Abdullahi was willing to give it a go. Fortunately, that didn't happen. I have a feeling it could have been disastrous. I mean, imagine a family of 10 in inflatable boats trying to cross a river. We came so close, so many times, to getting them out. When they were in Mazar Sharif, um, we came really close to getting them on a flight out of Mazar Sharif. Then that fell apart at the last minute. We had a couple of close scrapes with the Taliban in Mazar Sharif. His cover story was, we're in town to visit the Blue Mosque. That's what he would tell me. We're just, you know, we're here to visit the Blue Mosque. But one day, he was wearing, he forgot that he had an old American ID in the pocket of his shirt. The Taliban searched him, and they found him. Um, but, fortunately, they were illiterate, and they didn't know what it said. They kept it, but they let Abdul Hadi go. We talked his way into that. One close scrape was far scarier while they were there. It was one Saturday. They got picked up by the Taliban. At that point, they were living in their apartment and taken to the Taliban local headquarters. We found out about it. He let us know. Um, the children were terrified. They were crying. It really looked bad that day. But again, he talked his way out of it. Uh, but we got a, We immediately uh, moved him to a different apartment. They were in Mazar Sharif for several months. Uh, eventually, we got him on a list of people who were to be evacuated out of Kabul. All this was very shadowy, Beth. You know, I, I was never quite sure who I was talking to sometimes. And uh, they didn't want me to know exactly who I was talking to. Mm -hmm. So, another bus ride from Mazar Sharif back to Kabul. The family was in a safe house that I think was guarded by some British security company. I think this safe house uh, belonged to our State Department. They were to fly out at Thanksgiving 2007. It looked really good. And then at the very last minute, the Taliban threw a wrench into the plans, and they didn't go. Those were tough days. Uh, Abdul Hadi's a man of great character. Uh, and great strength, moral strength. Um, he led his family th through seven months of fear uh, and kept them all together. He's the real hero of the story. We were supporting players, and I, it's an honor to have, been a, to have helped a hero. But he got down after 
They came so close, and then nothing happened. Mm -hmm. I really wasn't sure whether we were going to be able to get him out then. We all tried to motivate him, keep the spirits up. Eventually, he decided to take a chance on going to Pakistan. He got visas to Pakistan. One of our members made contact with another group and they had a place for him to stay, the family to stay in Islamabad. This was in January of 2022. Um, so they went to Islamabad. I really wasn't sure what was going to happen then. I was back feeling kind of negative about it. I, I was fearful that they would get to Pakistan and then they would just be stuck. Mm -hmm. However, they were. Thanks for your They were in Islamabad for about 30 days. They were able to get the final seal of approval on the uh, special immigrant visa. From Islamabad, they flew to U.S. An anonymous donor paid the airfare from Islamabad to the destination of the U.S. Uh, it, it was thousands of dollars. I don't know exactly who did it. I think I know that person has never admitted to me that he or she paid it. But somebody out there took the money out of the bank and paid. Um, so we paid regularly to support them and to keep them hidden and fed, but then someone had heard of our efforts to put the money down on the airfield. I wasn't wow. able to go to the airport to meet them. Uh, my wife had had surgery, and this was uh, the latter part of February 2022. However, I, the two members of my group, uh, David Green and Scott Brady, went to the airport to greet them when they got off the plane. Um, it was a great day, immense sense of relief. They looked so happy in the photograph. Then I went down, my youngest daughter, her husband and I drove down to meet with all the body in the in May. I did. Um, it had been 13 years since we last saw each other. I drove. We drove up in the apartment complex where he lived. He came out. He looked exactly the same. A little older. I suspect I looked a lot older. Um, but you know, he opened his arms and I opened mine, and, and we hugged each other for the longest time. Didn't say anything. Then we went in the house, uh, the apartment, tiny little postage stamp apartment with 10 people. But there they were. Abdul Hadi, his wife, their children, all the boys and girls. You know, they had a place to live, food. They weren't worried about the Taliban coming to kill them. The boys and the girls could go to school. Abdul Hadi got a job and a good job. His wife could learn to drive a car. Um, and this is a huge city we're talking about here with layer upon layer of interstates. And they're just cruising down the interstate now along with everybody else. Uh, it's got the whole family loaded in a Toyota minivan. Uh, I'm so happy. I. Uh, in many ways, I think it was probably, well, I'm confident it was one of the most important things I've ever done in my life. And, then, and yet I, I, I saw that, that the longest, scariest days of my deployment came 13 years after I left. But I could not, I could not leave him behind. 
I couldn't have that on my porch. I'm not, I'm not the most military of men. I, I'm a confirmed part-time couch potato, but one thing that stuck in my head when I first joined the Army was the Army Reserve was that you don't leave people. And that's exactly what my government had done. Who served with us and gave our country 15 years of honorable service, put his own life on them. While people were here at home in the U.S. doing absolutely nothing to help, I couldn't, I couldn't abandon him. I absolutely would not have been. I was willing to spend whatever money I could and make as much noise as I could to get him to a place of safety. It's a really incredible thing to do. There's a, um, I've spent a lot of time in my life covering anti-Semitism and writing about the Holocaust, and there's a saying in the Jewish faith that if you save, whoever saves one life saves a world entire. And you save not just the one life, you know, all, that whole 10-person family, you made yes. such an impact. And yes. that, I it's, I, I would... I know you've done amazing things in your life. I can tell from, you know, your CV... But I would agree with you that the most important thing is what you did for Abdul Hadi and his family. So it's it's amazing to hear that story and just the perseverance. Like you said, he's clearly such a man of of high character to be able to get through that very difficult dark time and all of those starts and stops. And yes. there were so it's a many really points where incredible. Where it looked as if it was going to happen, and then at the last minute, it didn't happen. And yet, he had to go on, but mm -hmm. he did. He met the challenge. Uh, he's one of the bravest men I know, and the, one of the best men I know. I'm proud to call him my nephew. But, uh, but you know, there are Yeah, and I'm glad people. he's here. Oh, yes, yes. But as, as you know well, I know oh, yeah. there are thousands well, of people. Well, we were talking before we started Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. We were Thousands talking before we started left. recording. There are about 150,000 who yes. are stuck. There's, you know, and, and each of those individual primary applicants has four to maybe eight family members who they yes. would be bringing with them. So that, I mean, the magnitude of that is, is huge. Um, they're hungry. In addition to being afraid of being killed in front of their families, they're hungry. I am still mm -hmm. supporting two Afghan families in Afghanistan. One, the family of an SIV applicant, and the other, just a family of mostly women. And God help the women. Um, you know, they can't go to school, they can't work, they can't do anything. But, you know, right, it's yeah. just a moral duty if, if you see someone uh, who needs help, how can you turn away? To me, <clears throat> as I mentioned, I am a Christian. I think about the story of um, Joseph and Mary and the flight into Egypt with the infant Jesus. You remember, who was it? Who, who was going to kill all the children? Um, gosh, I can't think oh, goodness. Name. Yeah. Anyway, I... I, I, I <laughs> To me, these people are like the Holy Family on that flight into Egypt. And if they went by my house, if the Holy Family went by my house and needed help, who would I be to turn away and to not help them? Mm -hmm. To me, it's the same situation. They just speak a different language. They worship God in a different way, but they're human beings and uh, they're in fear and they're hungry and they need help. And I think that's something that so many Americans have forgotten because they haven't had the experience you had of getting to spend time with Afghans and realizing that just because they're across the world from us doesn't mean they're any different. I talk to women every day. I think the thing that really hurts my heart is all these young women like myself who are raised to be told that they could do what they wanted to do. And now they are terribly depressed with no future and I struggle to try to keep their hopes up, to keep their, you know, that's a, it's a huge 
burden. It's everyone in Afghanistan has a different struggle right now, but there are so many struggles to be had. It's very um, difficult. But the one thing I wanted to ask before we run out of time, because this is another important aspect of what you're doing, um, you're volunteering your time with the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys, unless I have somehow uh, mixed those words up. But can you, no, you tell don't. our listeners about why that's important in a what? Oh, I got it right. Good. Um, can you tell us about why that's important? You know, why are these prosecutors, these Afghan prosecutors at such risk right now? And why is it important to you to keep giving back in that way? Okay. Yes, I am involved uh, via the Association of Prosecuting Attorneys with an effort to find a path to freedom for Afghan former prosecutors. Uh, the Taliban were in this insurgents. We, along with the Afghan government, were fighting a counterinsurgency. A uh, big topic of counterinsurgency is the rule of law. Um, so, um, Afghan prosecutors, judges, and so forth were a very important part of the effort. Uh, the soldiers in the field were part of the effort, the lawyers in the courtroom were part of the effort. Uh, they took great risks. Uh, some of them have been killed, some of them have been wounded. I, during my own time in Afghanistan, I, went, I met one prosecutor who was the target of an assassination attempt. Fortunately, he escaped with a bullet hole in his leg, uh, but others have been killed. Um, they're not eligible for special immigrant visas, at least not now, and, they, and yet there they are. These are educated men and women. Important to remember, there are quite a few women who occupied legal positions in Afghanistan, who put their lives on the line to uphold the law. And now they're at the, uh, uh, they live in fear of ignorant men with guns. Um, and they wonder how they're going to feed their families. So, um, there has to be, I'm not an immigration lawyer, when I, when I read about SIVs and P1s and P2s, it gets very, very confusing. But basically, I know there, that right now there's, there's no way forward that there's people. Uh, there has to be a way. They were part of the effort, they did their part, and to leave them behind uh, does injury to them as well as to the Americans who served in the country, and as well uh, and to the reputation of our country in the long run. As I said, I, the consequences of this debacle in August of 2021 will reverberate for decades. Um, I'm just one man, but I know there are other people who think the way I do. We can't uh, entirely right the wrong that's been done by our government but we can mitigate it. We can find a way to help at least some of these people. These Afghan prosecutors deserve our help, and I'm gonna give them as much help as I can. I think it's so important, and, and I'm so glad always to talk about these nuances of the people who are left behind, because it is, it's a vast number of individuals who are put at risk when they worked with us under that promise that we gave them that if you work with us we're going to stay here we're going to make your country a you know a, a beautiful democracy and instead you know we've left i'm sure you've seen the news in pakistan and i'm sure our, some of our listeners are aware in pakistan right now um, afghan refugees are being deported yes. some some of them inside of shipping containers one of the shipping containers overturned and killed people inside that's how they're removing refugees from their country because Never. afghans yes. some of them have been there for the duration of the conflict or for generations because it's a porous border but yes. for all the people who fled there especially you know there's still no um at this point you know we're filming this on the first of november and at this point there is no assurance from pakistan that the individuals who are in American pipelines who are there are going to be safe. And that just to me is, um, it's so, so disheartening. What are those people going to do if they get shipped back to Afghanistan? It's gonna be 
they're going to be in immediate danger. Well, Pakistan. And I think about the prosecutors. Pakistan mm -hmm. is is responsible for this effort of deportation, but the United States government and our NATO allies caused these people to be in Pakistan. They're there because they're waiting on the U.S. government, the British government, and so on, all the NATO countries to process their applications. So um, if, if uh, Pakistan is putting people in shipping containers, um, we're partly responsible for that. And I will say, I definitely agree with you in terms of, you know, we created that instability that people needed to flee from. And right now they're only supposed to be deporting illegal immigrants. And I know many illegal, I know one woman, I've shared her story on this podcast before, but she fled to Pakistan to protect her daughter from her former husband who was going to set, give her in marriage to a Taliban member, which is a life of hell. And this woman had been forced into marriage to that man at the age of 13 and had, I believe, four children by the age of 18. Just a, And she tried to kill herself multiple times to escape that hell, you know, so she didn't want her daughter to go through that. And now she's an illegal refugee in Pakistan, and I worry. I haven't heard from her in months. I worry. What happened to her? I've, I've heard from so many Afghans in the course of this, and it just... It adds to the weight of every one of these decisions that's made by a government that, that impacts humans who are involved, yourself, Kevin, you know, myself, uh, the people we've had on here. And you're right, this is going to have reverberating effects for a very long time. And I'm terribly devastated at the way that it occurred. Me too. Me too. It, it, it weighs on me. I, I feel very ashamed of what my government has done. And, uh, the only thing I can do is try to mitigate the damage. But I, and I will do that as much mm -hmm. as possible. And I will say, sure, and I, I do the same, and I'm always heartened to talk to people who are doing the same thing, who won't just accept that feeling of you know being devastated by what the government has done, but who are actively attempting to right that wrong themselves, even though obviously neither of us is able to take that on our shoulders ourselves, or even somebody who, you know, is working with the Afghan evac coalition and has the power of the state department in some way, like they can't do that all themselves, but it's the fact that there are people who are willing to try that is, has been my strength in all of this. And so I'm so grateful that you're here to share that story and just remind other people like ourselves that it's been worth that fight. And I want to say before we end, Michael and I always end every um, episode with a story from an Afghan just to provide that perspective of what it, you know, what it's like for Afghans who are stuck in that country or for any, we want to hear from any one who has a story about living in Afghanistan during 20 years of war or as the Taliban came to power. And so our story today is very short, and it's actually dated. Uh, it's from August, so when you're listening to it, you know, keep that in mind that this person's talking about August. Um, it's from a stranded Afghan interpreter who is calling himself Z. Today is important. The Taliban announced tomorrow, 15 August, as Mujahideen Victory Day, as they assumed they were fought the right way. But we don't have any other Mujahid, Mujahid Victory Day except 31 years ago. On April 28, 1992, the Mujahideen came to power and the Russia pro-government collapsed. The Mujahideen included various factions and parties nationwide. The people were not happy with communist ideology and strict rules. Taliban are just the same cruel people who exploded cities and infrastructure and killed people by suicide attacks. Afghans will never forget the cruelty and misfortune they caused to Afghans for 25 years. I wish the international community and the U.S. government would never recognize the Taliban. Very soon, the schools and universities under the rule of Taliban will produce thousands of savage people who don't believe in humanity and human rights at all. <clears throat> By stranded Afghan interpreter Z. Um, I, it's a short one, but that is a very moving piece that I keep in mind every time there's a Taliban apologist out there on social media trying to make the Taliban's Afghanistan sound like it's this mecca 
for it's Afghans, and, and that's not true. No, of course not. Well, for anyone who wants to share a story, any Afghan, please remember you can send us anything. We will give you a pseudonym to protect your identity. Give us as many details as you'd like to share, and you can send those uh, letters to our show address, which is the Afghanistan Project Podcast at gmail.com. And, you know, Kevin, thank you so much for sharing your story and and for helping to nurture the democratic growth of Afghanistan and just that growth between the two countries too, those friendships, that camaraderie, and then even more that absolutely incredible work you did to save Abdul Hadi's life and his family's lives. It has really been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, Beth. I appreciate that. I have no regrets about what I've done. And thank you for what you're doing as well. It's important. I've enjoyed talking with you. It's been great. Well, thank you to all our listeners for sharing their time and supporting the people of Afghanistan, Tasha Kaur, and we hope to see you again soon.